because I had this hypothesis about um, the relationship between the goddess Kali and the Kaliug, which, of course, is a yeah. demon Kali, yeah. nothing, sensibly nothing to do with the goddess, yet mm. they are endlessly conflated. And, and the ways in which, in this local context, Kaliug became Kaliug, it became the yug of machinery, not of not only of the, the demon Kali. I was thinking today we can start our conversation by requesting you to return to that moment when suddenly looking at the calendars of gods and goddesses, you fell in love with them, those visuals, mm. and, and and altogether different kind of journey uh, uh, f for you as a anthropologist of material culture started. But before you took that turn, uh, was there an engagement with uh, images, uh, images of sacred? Uh, photographic images or calendar? Yeah, I think as an adolescent, I was always very much um, an arts rather than a sciences person, but um, that got dislodged by Trotskyite fervor. And um, so when I did my, so, so I did my undergrad at LSE, and I think I was attracted there very much by the the, um, the, the ghost of red LSE, as it was still yeah. then known. But I mean, I arrived about ten years too late for the, um, you know, for the revolution. So I was kind of doing chase up. Um, but uh, so no, my interests um, at university were very political, and I think that spilled over into um, the PhD mm. proposal, which was initially on um, uh, village resident factory workers. So there was a bit of kind of Marx, Engels, Romanticism, the idea that. Um, bucolic Indian peasants were being wrenched out of their, um, you know, relaxing affluent lifestyles and forced to work in continuous production, large industry. So, so there was a very much a kind of um, dark satanic mill imagery in the back of my mind. Mm. And that was really why I ended up in, um, in Nagda Junction, Madhya Pradesh. Um, in first of all, in 1982. So I did my PhD fieldwork 1982 to end of 83, and um, it was ostensibly on um, uh, work patterns. Um, so there was also a, a lot of questions derived from E. P. Thompson, the great labour historian, thrown right. in. It, it was a project on the anthropology of industrial labour. Um, but then sort of two things in parallel started to happen, which was that, um, uh, well, th firstly, I had this irascible we. I was there with my now wife, uh, Trudy. Um, we had this irascible neighbour, hmm. Berulal, now sadly departed. And um, uh, he, he was a very memorable, extraordinary character. And... Um, he once demanded that I go with him to his well and photograph him under his uh, the, the mango tree of which he was most proud. And um, anyway, I took this um, photograph on a you know a good SLR, uh, which I was very pleased with it. So it was half his face was cast in shadow. It's what studio Central Indian studio photographers sometimes refer to as Rembrandt lighting. <laughs> It's something that seemed to emphasize and um, crystallize his character. And um, anyway, the, the, so the film had to be sent back to the UK for processing, and I got this 12 by 8 print made. So it came back about three months later. Mm. And when I saw it, I was really delighted with it, proud of it. I mean, it was what I wanted to achieve in portraiture. I, you know, I would was fixated on the idea that the camera could somehow capture the soul or reveal more about the sitter than the, the sitter or the the camera person knew. Uh, anyway, so I gave it, you know, with great expectations to Berilal. And when he saw it, he was just furious and started waving it around and whacking it on 
hitting me on the head with a. He uh. said, "I didn't want all this chaya that uh. I made too dark and that it wasn't him." So it was a very <laughs> memorable initiation into um, the realization that um, the camera person's aesthetics and the subject's aesthetics can be very different, and that coiled yeah. around that apparently simple observation there was a lot to unpack about um you know ideas about what what is what what can and what should be made visible in what ways it should be made visible and in the case of portraiture how that relates to character what in character well what is character for a start but what in character can and can't be made visible and through what form mm. so that sort of got me thinking that photography was or local practices of photography were pretty interesting. And, th and at about the same time, I was um, occasionally in conflict with um, local commercial photographers because um, friends – so I had a, 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 a good Canon SLR borrowed from the University of London Central Research Fund. I also had my um, father's 1940 Leica 35mm camera. Oh. So two very good cameras. And um, friends would often ask me to photograph their weddings. And also because I had access to colour processing in the UK, which was a big, big attraction at the time. So we're talking oh. early 80s when there wasn't colour local, locally. Mm. Um, so, so I found myself sort of in market competition with um, with local photographers. So you know, I, I had free use of these cameras. The film was funded by this same university research grant. They also paid for the processing. And, of course, so the, the incentive for me was research material, you know, having an excuse to attend weddings and engagement parties and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, but then I'd encounter... Uh, angry photographers, you know, many of whom subsequently became very good friends, but at the time they were very angry because here was this foreigner, <laughs> out of the, you know, what everything that their businesses depended on. Mm. Anyway, so there were lots of um, anxious conversations at the time, but that that was one of the reasons that then sucked me into the, um, you know, very very. Um, a vital, um, enduring studio system locally. Mm. So I also started hanging out with um, photographers in, and clients in, in their studios as well as in village settings. Mm. But, but the other thing that was then happening alongside this was that, um, you know, I was sitting inside the, you know, the jopries of, um, uh, of local industrial workers mm. trying to – draw what in now seem very tedious and pointless graphs showing attendance rates. So, mm. so I was very much wrapped up in the time in the sort of classic um, old chestnuts of Indian industrial sociology. There were what's known as commitment and overcommitment, mm. um, which is the, the, this kind of hypothesized peculiar problem that the Indian industrial labor workforce was, was thought to suffer. So, so I was very engaged in that, and um, I think it was dawning on me that it was all a rather pointless exercise. <laughs> uh, at these moments, I'd look up uh, uh -huh. on their walls, and I'd see these fantastic images that, yeah, I fell in, in love with. They became a kind of aesthetic compulsion. I, I kept needing to see more of them. Mm. I mean, the other thing that happened was because I had this hypothesis about um, – the relationship between the goddess Kali and the Kaliug, which, of course, is a yeah. demon Kali, yeah. nothing, sensibly nothing to do with the goddess, yet mm. they are endlessly conflated. And, and the ways in which, in this local context, Kaliug became Kaliug, it became the yug of machinery, not, of, not only of the, the demon Kali. Mm. Um, so it, because of this connection, I started buying lots of calendar images of the goddess Kali. And um, I used to keep them rolled up on a wooden shelf in my village hut. 
Mm. And uh, one occasion I was berated by a villager who basically said, you know, what on earth are you doing? You've got all these, these things are highly dangerous. So right. they need to, well, you can't just buy them and leave them there. You can't just collect them. You need to put them on the wall. You need to install them and do a stapna. And then you need to worship right. them every morning, every evening. Um, you need to till up them. You need to give them agabati, dupe garlands you know they, they, they require active veneration and um, so that then i think started to open mm. up so, so you could say that all these things really were about um uh, an anthropological field worker going with various shaky hypotheses find, find discovering that they they don't work they not sufficiently interesting and that they get kind of uh, supervened by or dislodged by local agendas by by you know the people you're working with who actually who say well you know what about or, or insist on imposing their agenda on you i mean another trivial example i suppose that's significant i think would be you know, the, the taking photographs in the village as, you know, research material was always a big struggle, a conflict. So, um, you know, I, I had a vision of what I thought documentary photography as um, deployed by a social science researcher ought to be, you know, which was a kind of don't right. look at the camera, try and get it as, uh, no, as strive for images that are not contaminated by modernity. And, and it was a continual battle to get um, villagers to perform in the ways I wanted to perform because, of course, they had their own often very different views about what they wanted. Um, so they wanted generally full pose. You know, they'd disappear for 20 minutes and put on new sets of clothes, dust themselves in talcum powder, stand absolutely rigidly you know so i and uh, of course i'm still using analog film at that time and i distinctly remember thinking that you know most of the pictures are, i i was being forced to take the pictures they wanted and and it was a waste of my film and my money that's how i felt about it because i couldn't get them to mm. perform the, the the image i i needed and wanted and, and um, you know, they'd often come out with T-shirts or sweaters that had um, slogans I didn't like. Uh, you know, so, so there was, the, the, well, that's the point about doing field work. You, your, your agenda has to ultimately give way to the local agenda. And so it was that struggle that made me see that there was, you know, something important to be, to be investigated. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing, calendar art is that you know it, it is it's a, a vast repertoire with its own very specific detailed iconographic language and then it's fun learning it so the, the more you know the more you know the more you know the more empowered you feel the more committed you feel to learning more so i think doing you know doing the ten thousand hours on calendar art increases one's pleasure in the genre. So those questions of political economy, I think, are still crucially important. So I don't, I don't think I've abandoned a, 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 a political approach for a non-political. I mean, I think um, all those things are still, you know, utterly vital. So did that also trigger your interest in the uh, visual configuration of society in Europe? Yeah, I mean, up to a point. Well, let, let, let me approach it a slightly different way. I mean, one of the future books I'm working on called Prophetic Pictures, What Time is the Visual? question mark, is looking at a, a rather obscure genre of um, coloured frontispieces to astrological almanacs in Britain between roughly the 1830s to the 1860s. And um, what, what interests me about them is that they're, I mean, they're visually incredibly alluring um, and fascinating, and they're, they're deliberately mysterious. They're presented as, um, uh, well, they're called hieroglyphics. 
is the technical term that's used. So they're very, they very deliberately invoke the idea that there's a mystery to be uncovered. Particularly interests me in that case is that um, uh, they're in part a marketing device. So I mean, the other thing that you know, I also had to get my mind around both in relation to photographic practices in Nagda and also the calendar art or you know popular picture publishing industry in mm. India is that the, you, you can't lose sight of the commercial imperative. I mean, people are not doing these things as a mode of social commentary. They're doing it, you know, 95% of the time to make money and stay okay. alive. Um, li likewise, with these frontispieces, um, they, they were a marketing device. So the idea was that um, it was a forecast of what was going to happen in the coming year but it wasn't explained in the, in that publication. If you wanted to know what it all meant retrospectively, you had to buy the following year's publication. So it was kind of like a massive advertisement for next year's almanac. But the, the publisher of the almanac then had the problem that um, they, they had to try and show how many of their predictions from the previous year had turned out to be true. Because, you know, of course, that's also key to, you know, commercial viability. But the license, okay. so what I'm interested in is the license that the visual frontispieces give. Because you can have these kind of vague scenes of apocalyptic storm and, you know, you can have ships with broken masts and a pyramid and a palm tree. And you can either say, in retrospect, a year later, you know, look, we forecast the terrible storms in northern England, or we forecast the, um, you know, the terrible events in Egypt, or we forecast the, you know, the terrible happenings in Barbados. So, so they've got a, they make a claim visually because the because of the indeterminacy of the visual, because of the viscosity of the visual. Whereas had they tried to express that linguistically, you know, they would have either been right or wrong. So, so I'm interested in that context in the scope that um, the visual gives to interpretation is a, as a kind of laboratory where you can see what, well, my subtitle, what time is the visual question mark? is a sort of homage a bit to Michael Taussig's what, what colour is the sacred? Right. But, I mean, it's also intended to suggest that um, the temporality of the visual is more indeterminate. So that it, it, the space it occupies, the temporal space, and the right. space of, of, of interpretation is much bigger than that of conventional language. Um, so, so, yeah, so that would be one example of, um, you know, I'm, I'm not um, wholly focused on South Asia, although that is certainly my main right. interest. And, and, you know, I've also had moments in, um, in Euro-America that, you know, I thought were produced theoretical breakthroughs. I, I live in Cambridge and commute to UCL in London, and so I, you know, pre-COVID, you spend a lot of time hanging around King's Cross Railway Station for delayed trains. Mm. And, um, I remember on one occasion, about halfway through the writing of Photos of the Gods, um, uh, you know, one feature of the, the God posters, so-called in India, of course, is, the, is their frontality, um, the faciality, the, the visibility and frontality of the God's face is usually pretty crucial because that's the mechanism, the kind of the, the point of um, intersection between devotee and God. And mm. so that darshanic zone is, is crucially established by the frontality of the God. And I remember um, waiting for a train in King's Cross and um, browsing in W.H. Smith, the stationers, news agents, and looking up at these serried, rank, serried rows in the magazine racks of um, women's magazines. And the, it suddenly dawned on me, I mean, it was epiphanal, you know, it was a kind of flash of recognition mm. that every face in this magazine 
was smiling, was frontal, was basically saying, buy, buy me in this magazine. <laughs> and I thought, well, that, that's, that's exactly what drives the commercial print industry in, you know, targeting Hindus in India. And, and that, I think that uh, epiphany in uh, news agents in King's Cross mm -hmm. helped me think about what I subsequently came to call corpathetics i.e. a corporeal aesthetics, a kind of non-Kantian mode of direct address, which I think is what, you know, and a lot of my research has been working with publishers and artists in the industry. And, of course, they talk very explicitly about the need to engage the consumer, for the consumer to instantly see in their first glance at the image, that this is an image that will allow them to have an ongoing visual intimacy with the deity. And, you know, I've never sat in a, a UK magazine publisher's workshop, but I imagine they're, you know, when they're choosing their cover pictures, that it's precisely the same, same kinds of question. Right. So with this, uh, I mean, uh, when you were talking about the 18th century uh, Europe, you know, uh, predictions uh, with visuals, I was thinking of uh, 2020, much later, and there have been so many visuals flying past all around us. 2020, the pandemic vi through mediated visuals is, 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 is an interesting kind of case in point some sort of, you know, researchers reflection, you must have thought of something about all kind of visuals emerging from South Asia uh, during the time of pandemic. Some of those kind of, you know, visuals with frontal appeal, but there is diversity of them. Actually, I was thinking that, you know, at any point of time, there may be uh, a goddess named after Corona uh, mm. who would emerge in uh, India, particularly amongst Hindus. They seemed to be far more longing for sacred interventions how are you looking at i'm uh, not because i'm stuck in cambridge and i've, I've got <laughs> other urgent deadlines but i mean i i, I i'm assuming that, ne that from middle of next year i'll be able to start working in south asia again and um you know covid is still going to be on the agenda so i hope, hope to be able to do it then so i think you know part of it is that i i don't really have a remote working method i i need to be in the village, a small town, chatting to people and see, seeing what what I can see on walls and in picture shops, and um, so so part of it is it's not my method. But I mean, I you know obviously I've I've been thinking about it, and um, you know India has a kind of number of um, goddesses in place that you know uh, require minimal adaption. Uh, to meet the the new challenge, so um, you know, I assume at some point a uh, uh, Shitla will be reworked right. from the smallpox, the goddess of COVID. Right. Um, I mean, there, there's obviously been lots in um, uh, the Cal Calcutta Nurdurga Pandals mm. uh, relating to COVID. Um, so you know, there are there are there are topical forums like the um, Calcutta um uh pandals and the um ganesh chatati maharashtrian celebrations were, and i assume people well i hope people are working intensively on that um and i also assume that, that, that you know there will be a kind of place or the local pantheons will be um readjusted to accommodate them um in Batisura village near Nagda, where, where I lived and where I, you know, still work intermittently, mm. um, there, there's a goddess of phlegm called Bukuki Mataji. Ah. Um, so that's that morning phlegm, snot. That, um, so there's a goddess of snot in the village. Mm. Uh, I'd be surprised if um, uh, she doesn't morph in some way to accommodate... Um, uh, fever and um, COVID. Mm. Right. And, and of course, you know, the, the, the God poster industry in general, calendar art in general, well, is, has always been a striking mixture of um, kind of stability of a core set of iconographic themes, but with remarkable inventiveness around mm. the edges. You know, so one thinks, for instance, of 
Jay Santoshi Ma. Um, yes. It's not clear whether she was invented by B.G. Sharma in the mid 1950s through a chromolithograph that his brother running Sharma picture publication first published or, mm. or, or whether it, um, uh, well, it, th th that probably is a, a key point in its evolution. And yeah. um, B.G. Sharma was developing ideas from lo very locally produced uh, wood woodcut prints. That, that, of course, then gets a massive kickstart with the, or its dissemination is magnified through the 1975 J. Santoshima. Mm. And, um, and, you know, she's still pretty omnipresent in uh, outside of metropolitan India. Yes. And um, one's put in mind of Veena Das's argument about, you know, the, the rise of Santoshima being that it, it could appeal to a certain niche of urban working women who, mm. you know, had all the problems that everyone else had but didn't have the money to employ Brahmins okay. or the time or the time and ability to undergo complex ritual procedures. Avoiding sour foods on Friday was the kind of, you know, it, it's a quick fix, a, a quick, quick fix offered by an incredibly powerful but ultimately compassionate deity, um, which appealed enormously to urban women. So those kind of, you know, the popular uh, cult and popular gods and goddesses, I'm sure pandemic will give birth to a lot of uh, uh, new uh, aspects to the popular religiosity. Images of people turning on light uh, or uh, images of people banging on uh, pots and pans. They, they might. I have to say, I think that there'll probably be a lot of locally produced stuff that will then quickly fizzle out, assuming that COVID itself disappears in the next year or two. I mean, right. I think the, 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 the kind of heavy capitalized part of the God picture industry is, is very reluctant to take, to incorporate new themes like that, hmm. unless, they, unless they think they can be in it for the long run. I remember a conversation with M.L. Garg, who runs the Delhi um, section of Bridge, SS Bridge Bussy, you know, one of the most important picture publishers in the country. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd been spending several days at the Anna Hazare protest at Ram Lila Maidan. But I remember saying to him, and assuming he would say yes, you know, uh, are you going to be doing um, uh, an Anna Hazare portrait to put, put along with your you know, Nehru's and Gandhi's and Subhash Chandra Bose's and Bhagat Singh's and, and so on. And he, he sort of scowled at me and he said, um, um, do you ever see any um, pictures of Sanjay Gandhi? I, I, I mean, I could think of a couple of historical examples that I've got in my collection, but I, I had to say no because uh, I knew that, you know, no current publisher had Sanjay in, in their repertoire of Netajis. Right. And, and so he, his view was that, you know, unless someone's going to be around for decades, they're not going to invest in commissioning a portrait, sending it, and they send these things back and forth to the artist several times. They kind of do not, not quite focus groups, but they go out and ask their pavement retailers what they think of, um, a, you know, a new image. Mm. So he, he was completely sceptical. And mm. my guess, that he's probably, you know, if he was going to be told, well, COVID's going to be around for the next 50 years, then probably he'd invest. <laughs> if, if he thinks the vaccine's going to make inroads by the middle of the year, mm. you know, then no the way. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, which it comes back to our point that it's an industry. There's a commercial commercial bottom line. And I think one thing that happens is that often anthropologists, especially, they want to read these as, you know, organic crystallizations of social practice. Mm. And, but, but, and often they are, in many ways they are, but they, they have to be approached through the prism of the, um, the commercial bottom line of these, um, you know, often rather precarious industries. I hear from some of the uh, doctoral students who are, 
who was supposed to be doing field work this year obviously mm. their work was uh, uh, impaired by the pandemic lockdown and you know the norms of distancing social distancing uh, some of them were dealing with visuals uh, photo photographs particularly some of them were working on wedding photography and they have informed obviously the wedding uh, is no longer this year particularly it was no longer the same fat indian wedding that we are we are with so uh, it's been low profile relatively comparatively low profile weddings wherever it has happened and mm. wedding photographers have been uh, uh, awaiting an assignment for some time so if that is a situation on the whole uh scholars who are interested in visuals would have uh, uh the need to uh, do certain kind of methodological juggling or or some sort of you know, rethinking about uh, how to approach visuals do you think it's uh, going to be the case well the the anthropology of visual culture is probably going to look a lot more like the art history of visual culture with 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 more thick description thrown in right i mean I it can't help but um pretty significantly transform the practices and the outcomes i mean i, I was thinking about this earlier and um thinking that you know the key thing that will be lost is 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 contingency so mm -hmm. you know that that experience i narrated earlier with my neighbor berulal was all contingent i mean if i hadn't been living in the village i wouldn't have had a, a neighbor let alone him um we wouldn't he wouldn't have taken me out to his well you know so all those things came out i mean they were nothing to do with my at that time explicit research agenda mm. they, they, they were kind of um chaff or byproducts of the um of the fact of living in a in a community i mean the the other example i thought of um uh the kind of underwrites the role contingency plays is that um you know when i first went to do my 15 months field work in india in 1982 uh flew into bombay um spent a few days there uh, i had a list of half a dozen places with big factories that i was going to go and stay in briefly and mm. which was the most suitable um i went overnight on what was then called frontier express now um golden temple mail mm. uh, from bombay central to nagda junction i i shared a coupe i don't really remember those it was weirdly luxurious two berth compartments right they, they used to be available on um most big expresses but i shared a coupe with a retired engineer who'd been to nagda because uh. of the fact there many times and he he told me uh, i had no idea where i'd stay and he recommended chandra lok lodge uh, Ch yeah chandra lok lodge this oh. basic lodging house where i went and ended up staying 3 months so that the contingency was that um i i happened to meet this guy he happened to know this lodging house i went there I was then taken after a couple of months by the son of the lodging house to mm. meet someone who ran a tea shop um who was of a different caste and he wanted to use me as his alibi so he could skulk in the background and look at this tea house owner's very beautiful daughter mm. and so this all happened and I then became very good friends with the tea house owner and it turned out that he was born in a local village which turned out to be the village bratisura in which i then went and spent a year and as since when i spent many more years so if you think about all those contingencies they they're real world accidents you meet someone on a train you go to a lodging house the son of the lodging house owner is in love with this beautiful girl across the other side of town etc mm. etc et that that's how i found my field site and you know, if you imagine the covid virtual version of that the non contingent version right it, it, it describes a completely different journey i think yeah so just to say i'm looking forward to being post covid as is um, pretty much all of anthropology mm. i mean i think 
probably there are a few digital, you know, proselytizers for digital anthropology who are rubbing their hands in glee. You think that it's a chance to demonstrate the, um, you know, fantastic vitality of their method to all the rest of we Luddites. <laughs> <laughs> So what about uh, all kind of images that we come across in uh, the virtual domain, uh, in the social media platforms? Uh, those mm. are images without uh, clear copyright. Many times the authorship of the images uh, would not be clear. Uh, even the veracity of image is uh, questionable often. Mm. Yet those images are... Uh, part of people's everyday life, so to say, right? Those images mm. uh, mediate uh, the sense of living these days. Do you think uh, in this kind of situation, probably it's necessary for social scientists interested in visuals to turn attention to some of those dubious kind of, spurious, far more spurious kind of images. Oh, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. But, I mean, I think m most images have always been spurious in <laughs> in similar ways. So, uh, you know, my, my position on the digital is that it's not ontologically different. There's just more of it. It's quicker. Mm -hmm. And um, it gets into spaces that, you know, other images didn't tend to occupy. But, you know, if you think about the relationship of calendar art to photography in India mm. and, you know, and, and then trace that up to the present digital creative moment or the moment of spuriousness. Mm. Um, well, you know, the entire history is littered with um, images that are a hybrid in that sense. You know, they're real mixed media creations. I mean, one of my fav favorite recent, um, you would say, spurious images is a Punch Muki Nag, this five-headed cobra, uh, uh. which is very, very popular in uh, Bhattisura village and in uh, around about Nagda. Uh. I mean, it actually originated um, uh, in a village near Jamshedpur, so I mean, a long way away from Madhya Pradesh, or this uh. part of Madhya Pradesh. But it was um, the, the Im its image was reproduced in a local newspaper, which mm. somehow made its way to Nagda. The local, so a local photo studio, who was then followed by many other imitators, started selling laminated prints of an enlargement of this pixelated image from a newspaper. Right. That was replaced by a much better upgraded, properly photoshopped image, mm -hmm. which is very widely circulated. But, but if you, the, the, there are lots of things to say about that. I mean, the, perhaps in terms of the, the question of its spuriousness or not, or its newness or not, is that, you know, of course, the, um, the, the, the potential viewers or consumers of that image have been preconditioned from birth to assume that there are five-headed cobras all over the place because they're surrounded by pictures of them. In this case, um, chromolithographs of, um, you know, protective hoods over Krishna, et cetera, et cetera. So it's iconographically part of their world. It's not it's, um, bracketed off as a zone of religious iconography. It, it's, um, it's very present as visual truth in their daily life. And I think that, you know, well, that, that book I did on calendar art was called Photos of the Gods because mm. of the you hear most commonly Bhagwan Kifoto, mm. you know, not paintings of the gods. So, so there is also this lexical and semiotic slippage. So that for you know many people, especially in rural India, mm. um, paintings of gods are photos. So we, there's a kind of seamless field of the visual. Uh, and, and very little of which is spurious. So that's one of the ways of thinking about the the, the, the ways in which a spurious Panch Mukhi Nag, you know, it seems to be not spurious for most of its consumers. Mm. But of course, the other thing is they're endlessly being told, and they know from their own daily experience that um, they, they have, most of them have in their hands a, uh, phone camera that in theory allows them access or a way of capturing things right. that previously weren't capable of being seen. So, you know, the other 
they have their own rationalization. So they know that, you know, in the, when we only had studios and cum cumbersome apparatus, it was very difficult to persuade a five headed snake to go into a photo studio. Whereas now, what obviously happened was somewhere near Jamshedpur, you know, was cycling along on their motorbike and saw this snake by the side of the road, had their camera in their pocket, whipped it out. For, it's, so there's a, there are ways of rationalizing it, right. uh, modern, you know, secular ways, progressive ways that explain the, the, the appearance of these spurious images. So I think once you get inside the logics of, of these image journeys and productions, it, um, well, I mean, I, I don't think it gets any less troubling politically, but, you know, you, you can see why, why they, these images are able to compel people. If I'm not wrong, you have been a viewer of a Hindi cinema. Uh, mm. Bollywood has uh, attracted your attention not as a not as a writer mostly as a viewer and 2020 was also known for all sorts of things in bollywood were you uh, catching up with uh, some of those reports i have to say i've um, in my old age i've become one of those nostalgics who looks back to the mid 70s with great fondness yes yeah, so i i i find myself still endlessly returning to you know the amar akbar antonis of this world <laughs> and, and that's I've been thinking about a, a, a new book in the pipeline, which uh, is a sort of homage to Man Mohan Desai. Wow. Um, with a working title of which is um, uh, Omar Anton Anthony. <laughs> okay. And it's going to be, a, it's, it's basically about my, it's going to be my manifesto for what I call alt entity as opposed uh, to identity. All right. So um, this is uh, this is um, flowing from the conclusion that there's too much identity in the world, and we need more alt entity. We need more fluidity, movement, journeys, translations, iterations, deformations, and so the, the, this book, which obviously you know takes its um, basic architecture and idea from Amar Akbar Anthony would actually, in the first place, be about the film careers of Omar Sharif, Anton Differing, and Anthony Quinn, oh. who, who, who all, of course, were forced to play a certain kind of vague foreigner. I mean, mm. their careers were all marked by these extraordinary journeys of impersonation. I mean, what now negatively would be called cultural appropriation. Mm. So, so, in a way, this... A hypothetical book is also a cautious plea for cultural appropriation. Okay. Omar Sharif was Egyptian, oh. um, yet was cast as Dr. Shivago in David yeah. Lee's film. Anton Differing um, came from a German Jewish family, but in post war Britain got completely typecast as a the immediately recognisable Nazi officer. Right. So he always played Nazi oppressors. And then Anthony Quinn, who was Mexican-American, is most famous for his performance as Zorba the Greek. Mm -hmm. So in the way in which they exemplify these, you know, the, so like Amar Akbar Anthony, they're all from the same blood. Mm. And yet society has cast them in these different identities. Mm. In, in the spirit of Man Mohan Desai, I, what I want to do at the end is a kind of grand transfusion that uh -huh. will allow their blood to intermingle in its commonality once again. Sounds pretty, uh, pretty dramatic, almost like a good Bollywood. Uh, uh, well, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, there's an element of whimsy, but um, it's also intended to be, a, I hope, serious contribution to debates around. Um, identity, cultural appropriation, yeah, right. and, and, um, and possible ways of being in the world. Mm -hmm. And I hope it will also be a defense of a certain critical practice of anthropology. Mm -hmm. uh, how is it related to the critical practices in anthropology? Well, I think, um, I mean, especially uh, in response to Black Lives Matter, I mean, quite rightly, 
in um, North American and um, European, I suppose, especially British anthropology, there's been a, a renewed interrogation of anthropology's colonial past and part origins. Much um, needed. Yeah, yeah, definitely much needed, and the, there's a lot, a, a lot to learn from that. Um, but I also think it developing, it, it's giving rise to uh, um, a set of essentialist assumptions that I, I would hope to gently question and probe uh -huh. uh, in, in uh, a work on alternity. Okay. I think we need politically and at a disciplinary level to regain the possibilities of alternity. And I suppose, you know, living under the shadow of impending Brexit in a country that, um, you know, as much as India is being uh, destroyed by xenophobic ethno-nationalist um, obscenities, um, one feels this very, um, very strongly. Right. Uh, you mentioned Yugendra Yadav earlier. I think he came up with that phrase, ethnopreneurs. Mm. And, um, you know, Britain is uh, very much in the sway of dangerous ethnopreneurs at the moment of the white nationalist variety.